Now, the question is, if you don't want an ordinary life, how many of us are willing to take that extra step or that extra risk, right, uh, to get that extraordinary outcome? But if you're not willing to take that extra step, then you should be okay with an ordinary outcome. Being a multifaceted individual is the most fascinating thing for any human being today. We as millennials, we are all multifaceted. Let's face it, we are. But guess what? Can we bring our multifaceted personality into our work? Can we do something in our career? Well, not exactly, right? So let's face it. If you need a blueprint of how to do it, stay tuned for this episode. Because my guest today is Shanini Prakash. She's a multifaceted individual herself, of course. She's an author slash entrepreneur slash venture capitalist slash angel investor slash national level badminton player slash oh, many more things. So this goes on and on and on. And her book is Clueless at 30. Doesn't it ring a bell for all of us? Most of us are 30 plus and we are kind of clueless. So to get more perspective from this particular person, stay tuned for this episode with Shalini Prakash coming your way. You know, ever since I started the season two of the Indian Millennials podcast, which has become, uh, which is available on YouTube and other video platforms, uh, I always felt that uh, I needed to have uh, you on one of our episodes, uh, purely because of the book that you've written. Uh, you are many things among that is one, one is an author. So I uh, do this at 30 because uh, the theme is the Indian Millennials and uh, most of the Millennials today, the youngest Millennial is 26 years old. And most of us who are in that generation are post 30 and above. And when I came across your book, Clueless at 30, I felt, look, I need to have Shalini on this episode and discuss so many things because uh, I think this book covers the entire millennial problem and the solution as well. What we are going, what we go through as a generation and what, what can be done to overcome those things. So Shalini, thank you so much for doing this. It's an absolute honor to have you on this episode. And uh, looking forward to an amazing conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rohit. I'm not sure if I have all the solutions or if my book offers the solutions, but uh, definitely I really enjoyed the process of putting it all down. Awesome. So let's get to the book, right? I mean, what made you write Clueless at 30? Firstly, I mean, what was your inspiration behind writing this book? And the amazing uh, caption of the book as well, or the title of the book, rather. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so I am from Bangalore and, and I grew up in a South Indian household where I think a lot of us grew up with certain uh, blueprint for life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that you need to either be a doctor or an engineer, um, maybe a CA or a lawyer, right? And I, I, I came from one of those households where, you know, there was certain expectation in terms of what you're supposed to do in your career and uh, so on. So there's not much thought put into it. Probably you know it since you're eight years old or 10 years old that this is what you're going to be doing. And uh, which is what I did. I um, I did my engineering in one of you know top colleges here. I had like a couple of campus placement offers. I started off with a pretty decent uh, pay as well and you know, in a corporate career. But then, you know, like very um, at, at some point in your uh, career, at least very early in my career, I started feeling like, you know, I'm just sort of you know, in this, um, you know, like following the cattle, right? Like everyone's, mm -hmm. I'm just doing what everyone's doing, you know, just to, to sort of fit into that uh, group or that herd. And um, I slowly started seeing myself distancing from that herd because I, I was not able to associate with that the set path for life. Mm -hmm. And and then there's this frustration in my early 20s where I started thinking about, hey, I did everything that I was supposed to do. Why is it that I feel like, something's empty i mm. this this moment where i'm supposed to feel like i've arrived in life where everything's just supposed to fall in place because i did everything that i needed to do to have a successful life or a successful career but i'm not happy or you know i don't feel like this is my path and so on so i think um that started making me think and uh because of which i changed my jobs i went and did my masters a lot of us think you know doing masters is all the um, you know is is the solution for all the life problems that you have. I ended up doing it twice and I got no answers. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think I went through this phase late in my 20s where I really wanted to crack this. It seemed like everybody around me seemed so happy with their life. They had figured out what is it that they want to do. They seemed like 
um, you know, uh, they, they were very passionate, they were very committed. And I wanted to feel that passion too. I wanted to feel that commitment too, where I say, okay, this is my life's work. I'm going to dedicate my life for the next 20 years. I don't know, maybe it's for writing codes or saving animals or whatever it is, right? But I wanted to find out what my calling was. And I started reading a lot of books. I took a lot of programs online just to figure out what is it that I'm passionate about? What is it that I am born to do? And, and you know, the answers just didn't come. Uh, you know, I changed my jobs, I changed my careers, and then, you know, took up programs. The answers just didn't come. And then, you know, all these books that we also read in the market, you know, it could be like Ikigai or the likes of it, many of them, they actually tell you about how life is at the center of, you know, many things, you know, you find what you like and then, you know, make sure you have the resources and the money and, you know, it, that it pays you and that the center of it lies your ikigai. And, but, you know, the starting point for a lot of these things is, you know, knowing what your starting step is, mm -hmm. right? Or what is it that your calling is or what is it that you're passionate about? And uh, I've always struggled answering that question. If somebody asked me, what do you, what are you good at? Or what do you, what do you like doing? Mm -hmm. um, I don't have that answer. Even today, you know, I really struggle answering that question. Mm -hmm. If somebody asked me, hey, what do you, what do you, you know, when I was 18, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would say no software engineer, because that's what I was told I'm supposed to do. And then I think at every given time, you're always sort of answering um, based on what you've been told you're supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. And you've never really um, dwell deeper inside to answer that question. So now, you know, all of us struggle answering that question. If somebody says, hey, what are you passionate about? Or what are you good at? What do you like doing? A lot of us don't know the answers, right? So books like these, uh, a lot of them say, oh, unleash your potential, you know, and then you'll go conquer the world. And, I, and I'm like, yeah, I know that. I know I will go conquer the world once I know what I'm really good at or what is it that I want to do, right? A lot of us don't know. So I think this book actually came for all those people who don't know what their starting step is mm -hmm. or they don't know uh, what are they good at and they're yet to discover themselves. Because I think there, is a lot, there are a lot of books out there which says, what can you do once you know what you want to do as opposed to, hey, how do I go figure out what is, what is my figuring out process mm -hmm. like? And of course, when you are in that figuring out process, of course, you know, there are a lot of emotions. There's a lot of baggage that you're carrying as well. And I think that's what I've tried to talk through the book. And that's what really inspired me to say, hey, this is not for the people who have figured out. This is for all the people who are yet to figure out and they don't know what their starting step is. And uh, yeah, so this is really what inspired me to write a book because I couldn't find one which was very relatable to me. So I've, uh, yeah, this is my attempt to do that. I mean, you know, I mean, most of us in our uh, 20s, fail to discover what we are good at because at that point of time we are we basically have nothing to lose right i mean you finish your course you just want to get your you want to just hop into one opportunity you don't think a lot before you know grabbing an opportunity or whatever you just take whatever come that comes towards you now at the age of 30 there is a sense of financial independence a little bit of you know we have some sort of financial uh, backing that we have made ourselves and oh, yeah. uh, we have some of our personal relationships sorted or if not we are at, we know at least what we don't want and what we uh, want rather right so but yet people are i mean we are all very clueless at 30 we are all very very clueless in terms of trying to figure out a lot of things because there's a very important factor that you have highlighted brilliantly in your book it's FOMO obviously fear of missing out and fear of missing out is something which uh, has affected I think everyone maybe it's because of social media or I don't know what the reason is but we all have FOMO mm -hmm. and the, the again I don't want to give too much too many snippets of the book I want people to buy this book rather than read it for themselves but the acronyms that you've come up with right you know for FOMO and then something called a SOBO which is search of the uh, you know better opportunities which is like, okay, yeah, FOMO. Instead of looking at it from a FOMO point of view, look at it from a SOBO perspective and maybe things will change. And all these things, of course, come from personal experience. I'm sure it's all, uh, it's about your life. It's kind of a semi-autobiography, if, uh, if I may use that word. What was your process of, you know, trying to take that first step? You know, let me take that first step and maybe doing something different, maybe starting your own venture or getting into some other new corporate gig or whatever it is right so how did you push yourself to take that first step um i think uh that happens at every given uh, phase of your life i think even right now i'm like pushing myself to do new things and explore new things but mm -hmm. it never uh it never stops but i think um so so to to begin with right i mean when we talk about uh fomo which which you brought up 
I think all of us undergo FOMO of uh, different nature. For me, it was more to do with, I always felt like the sense of this clock ticking, you know, that, oh, I'm young, I'm smart, I have the resources, I'm supposed to do something, right? Mm. Uh, it's that expectation that you have uh, of yourself. And maybe sometimes it's your society, sometimes it's your parents. Um, but a lot of it is also self-imposed for most of us, right? And I think um, for me, for me, it was very similar too, where uh, because you know you have everything uh, in the sense that you have everything that a person can uh, possibly ask. You know, you have the smarts, you have the network, you have the uh, resources, you have the degrees, you have you have the, you know you have most things in place. So you're supposed to do good in life or well in life, and you're supposed to figure out everything uh, that mm-hmm, you're supposed mm-hmm. to do. And uh, I was I was not in that uh, place, right? I think that was okay. FOMO for me. And then, you know, see if you're quitting your job or, you know, you wanting to experiment with your life and your parents or your family thinking, you know, you're cuckoo in the head because, you know, who quits jobs just like that? And, you know, when you have like your colleagues or your friends and family who are like getting promotions, buying homes, buying cars, and, you know, you just want to like do something uh, with yourself and answer the deeper questions of life. And, you know, so it's, which is probably not very um, appreciated within the uh, family and for me, um, it was um, it was really to do with uh, taking uh, chances uh, on yourself, right? And I think uh, what is, I think it's also do, to do with uh, you know my background in sports and stuff, which which I, I, I guess we will talk about in a bit. Is uh, but you know you know that when you want something good in life, uh, you always need to take those chances. As cliched as it sounds, right? Because uh, I've said this before, where all of us want extraordinary outcomes in life right i think we all don't like average lives Mm. Uh, we all want extraordinary lives now the question is if you don't want an ordinary life how many of us are willing to take that extra step or that extra risk right uh to get that extraordinary outcome but if you're not willing to take that extra step then you should be okay with an ordinary outcome uh, because if it was so easy for everybody to take that extra step and do, then everybody would be extraordinary, right? I mean, it is not possible because th- that's a lot more, you know, the sacrifices that you need to make. You know, you need to be willing to take failures. You need to be willing to make a mockery out of yourself. There's so many things that you need to be uh, willing to do to get that extraordinary um, outcome for yourself. And I think um, letting go of those inhibitions is what sort of lets you take that uh, first step right mm-hmm. saying you know you're gonna you're gonna do this you know for yourself and taking the chance on yourself and I think it's easier when you're also probably younger you know in your late uh, you know maybe in your 20s or early mm-hmm. 30s right and um, I think that's really what uh, why um, I think that's what really sort of pushed me to explore newer territories which is what pushes me even today um, you know maybe 10 years ago and even now it's just about willing to take those extra chances because I want new dimensions in life uh, for my career, you know, for personal growth as well as professional growth. Uh, I'm in pursuit of that. So I'm willing to take those um, new chances and push myself to explore uncharted territories. I mean, it's you're, you're basically saying, you. I mean, taking a conventional path, if it works for you, it's good. Yeah. But in order to, you know, if you are, if you are desirous to have an extraordinary life, you need to take a very, you know, Next of course, of course. See, to do, uh, it is my belief that uh, to to live an extraordinary life, sometimes you need to have multiple uh, dimensions. When I say extraordinary, it's very relative, right? Like yeah. what's extraordinary for me is not extraordinary for someone else. And, you know, someone might think I have like an extraordinary life, but maybe the, another person doesn't think I have an extraordinary mm-hmm. life, right? It's about your own definition of what is extraordinary mm-hmm. for you, right? And for me, it is about having eclectic um, experiences, uh, eclectic, um, um, I I don't want to use the word careers, but yeah, you know, trying to do different things um, because a lot of these things also inspire me to do better work. There's a lot of learning that comes from uh, different experiments that you run or experiences that you undergo. um, And I like it. So, and I think I grow professionally and personally while I'm doing uh, those things. And uh, I'm always looking out for that. And yeah, and I think that's that's what's uh, important. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, whatever whatever sort of helps you grow, I guess. You're Shani Prakash, corporate professional slash uh, you know uh, entrepreneur slash venture capitalist slash former national level badminton player for India slash South Bangalore girl slash uh, uh, 
cake lover because that's what you said in one of your, <laughs> one of your mini uh, interviews slash I don't know uh, this, I mean the reason why I'm saying slash because you've highlighted a very important uh, uh, aspect of the whole concept of slash when I first read it I thought it was another acronym because your book is filled with acronyms and very uh, you know nicely put acronyms uh, when I saw the slash factor I thought oh, this is like you're saying that okay in order to do one great thing you need to be good at multiple things and uh, maybe that has kind of shaped your personality saying that okay uh, slashes are so important in life especially in today's day and age so how do you see i mean how do people add on to that i mean many people are just stuck in their own in the rut of you know being one particular one dimensional way of thinking one particular job or one particular way of living how does one add these slashes so is it already there is it does it already exist So um so let me sort of take two steps back on why how I came up with the word slash and why uh slash um so this was this was much before even I thought of writing a book um this was during my exploratory time and I was trying to figure out what is it that I want to do with my life and uh what is it that I'm born to do and so on right when I was trying to answer all these questions one of the things that i did was saying you know if i'm in um you know in the startup ecosystem i'm meeting some amazing people i'm not in a cubicle job where i'm sitting 9 to 5 i said think about somebody who's working in um you know services industry who's actually doing that you know in uh, 96 how stifled or boxed they must be feeling mm-hmm. every single day right um and uh, so so that when i was thinking about that i said you know maybe i should form a community for people who are clueless in life you know mm-hmm. saying if they're all trying to figure out what is it that they want to do i don't know mm-hmm. uh how about if i form a community for people who don't know what is it that they want to do in life and that's how um uh slash started uh, it was called find your slash that was the community that i started several years ago uh where um, you know i ran programs for a year year and a half where it was more like hey if you're clueless just come you know and it could be um and and i had some amazing people i had doctors to lawyers to cas to designers and you know the people that you probably thought were the most sorted in life right i mean i attracted all those people so so it's 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 interesting that you know at some point in our lives i think there is one part of us which is always exploring which is always wanting more mm-hmm. right and um, all the all of, all all of them were uh, happy doing what they were doing there was there was there was a new dimension that each person was seeking for their own you know personal satisfaction or for professional growth or whatever it is that they are uh, chasing and uh, what what i've also learned during that time when i was researching a lot about how do people go about living this happy life or passionate life was that um, you know you become like a more holistic or a fuller person uh with all the uh diverse experiences that you collect for example if you want to be really uh, a really good um say wildlife photographer you need to understand wildlife slash ecology slash art slash tech slash um you know zoology i don't know like so many things that you need to understand to become a very good wildlife photographer because you need to have so many dimensions to your work So so what I was saying is hey when you don't know the um one thing that you want to do in life just go be 10 things mm-hmm. right and hopefully when you figure out what is it that you want to do all those 10 20 things that you did will sort of play a role in uh shaping that uh journey for that one career or that one passion that you have eventually found because what makes a unique um a wildlife photographer is not just that he can hold this camera right i think it's it's your understanding of so many things which gives you that unique lens and that's what makes your work unique because of all the unique learnings that you've had so that's what slash was all about you know be an artist slash blogger slash technologist slash yoga enthusiast a banjo player whatever it is that rocks your boat and just follow your curiosity follow your um um uh you know uh, uh, intention around wanting to learn more just to play with something as opposed to wanting um an end outcome of it if somebody said hey do you want to do this don't think too much just do it you know and the good thing about slash is um you know there is no right answer right i mean you can do it for two months if you don't like it you can move on to the other thing because sometimes when you put so much emphasis on finding that one calling one passion you don't move your finger because you don't know if yeah. it is or if it is not sometimes you need to be a willing to scratch the surface or play around a bit to see if this is something that you like or not like and if you if not you still learn so much from it and you move on right mm-hmm. so i think that's what slash was all about okay. um you know finding these multiple avatars you can call it you know <coughs> 
our your portfolio of avatars and so on and uh, yeah that is that is what find your slash was all, all about and that's how the concept of slash uh, uh, came about which i've uh, written in the book yeah uh, i'm very uh, very curious to understand uh, your own slashes okay first you are a national level badminton player i mean yeah. then you you went into corporate life you started your journey in, in uh, you know your career as a software engineer post engineering then you did your masters then yeah. you became a consultant then yeah. you did business development for yeah. uh, for uh, I, can i can i say which company in talks sure. yeah in talks you did that with them and then you started your own, uh, you know venture and before that you became a venture capitalist yeah and you also worked with a startup aggregator yeah when i look at this software engineer okay then this 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 are the kind of growth path which is not very conventional in india i mean it's not a, it's not an ideal way of looking at it because in india we generally look at people uh, changing their designations but their job remains the same yeah you you start off maybe as an associate and you become a head and so on sure. and so forth how did the whole concept of career hopping come in in your life and before that how how has playing badminton national level shaped you as a personality because you seem like a very adventurous person to me mm-hmm. you seem like a very uh, you know you're very professional and also very adventurous you want to do new things you are very you're hungry for more uh, that's the kind of person that you come across has badminton really shaped all these things that what kind of value has it added to your entire personality i'm just sure. curious to know i'll answer that um um in two parts okay. so the uh, you know so um as a as a young girl i started uh, training uh, for uh, badminton i started playing at the age of 9 okay. and um, and you you know that's the only childhood that i've probably known and for me probably that was the real education because i really didn't go to school or college um, because okay. you know you're probably spending all the time on court mm-hmm. uh, uh okay. practicing and so so were all my peers as well right and um and and you know irrespective of what level a uh, sportsman re- uh, reaches but you if you have trained professionally for a certain duration of time that sort of is uh, ingrained in your personality for the rest of your life mm-hmm. right and i think it it doesn't change for anyone um so one of the things that i've learned is um that uh, having patience uh is very very important and i think a lot of us don't you know all of us live in this you know uh, maggie noodles generation where you think okay i just work for a short period of time and i'll see overnight success or i'll become an overnight sensation right and a lot of us don't have that patience where we say hey we need to strive or work hard for two years or three years or five years uh, to ultimately become that number one or the champion right i think I think one thing that I've learned is perseverance and along with it comes patience that you know you need to stay at it uh, stay at your goal and uh, no matter what happens you know you sort of don't take your eyes off from the um, end goal that you have and the second thing uh, that I have uh, learned also is the uh, value of hard work right I think it never never fails anyone um there is this also this joke and even now I just even within the, our, our uh, friend circle right I mean just because you are an ultra smart person um and you're super smart um doesn't mean that success is guaranteed mm-hmm. you know um because even in sports right i mean you may be very very talented um uh, you know where you may have like artistic uh, strokes or very good strokes and stuff right but when you actually play the game right there is temperament and there's a lot more that goes into play for you to ultimately become a champion and sometimes i think i know a lot of people like me including me i didn't have that talent like where i was born with uh, the talent to play badminton i didn't and uh, for me i think it was a lot to do with hard work and the time that you're actually putting into sport to actually you know mastering that stroke or you know playing right and it i had to play and play and play to become good mm-hmm. um so i know that hard work can take you a long way but sometimes you're just smart it's not enough you also need to put in that uh, hard work you know it doesn't matter on court off court wherever it is right so the value of hard work and belief that the hard work is something that will ultimately uh, mm-hmm. that will uh, pay off right i mean these are like subtle things that that i've learned and uh, which i sort of put it even now and it probably comes default i'm not even thinking about these mm-hmm. things right and um, uh, sometimes also <coughs> like uh taking failures right i think it comes uh, very uh, natural to me of course you know it, it is disappointing at times that if you've tried 
something for a year or two and it hasn't materialized uh, of course you know it is disappointing but that's probably uh, doesn't mean that you know once you push to the uh, ground you're not going to stand up right and i think that is something i probably you know i probably failed more in my career than the time i've been successful but a lot of people don't remember failures they only remember your uh, successes or the high points in your uh, life and career so uh, but yeah i think ultimately it is the failures that shape us right and it makes us uh, better and we don't give enough credit to the failures that we see in our lives i think there's so much that comes out of it so yeah willingness uh, to experiment and you know being okay to fail is something that comes uh, i wouldn't say naturally to me i would let me say more like i know how to deal with it um and you know that sort of uh, pulling yourself together and standing up again is something that i've learned uh, through uh, sport and i think that sort of naturally extends to even um you know answering the second part of your question is you know around this whole career hopping right and i think for example i've tried to do uh, a startup two three times and it has failed uh, all the times that i've uh, started right maybe i'll do it again maybe i won't but um, maybe just because there is something that doesn't work for you you don't stop exploring other things there are a lot of things that have worked for me as well like for example even this book clueless at 30 um my first choice of publisher uh was rupa publications who actually released my book as well the first time uh they rejected my book uh okay. and uh yeah they didn't uh, they thought this book is never going to fly and um and uh, i i and you know I, and i'm not from literature background i don't come from journalism background and um i and i really wrote this of you know pure interest and you know and for the love of uh, writing and i'm not even a writer you know it's just um way to express and uh, i did that and they thought you know and even my friends and like there were a lot of naysayers when i said hey i wanted to write and they were like oh dude like who's going to read your book you're not like a ratan tata and you know like you're not this famous person what gives you the authority to write you're not from academia you're not you know there are a lot of naysayers irrespective of what you want to do a lot of times if it's not your uh default chosen path a lot of people you know uh, don't really think it's the right thing for you but you know if you have a strong uh, conviction sometimes you just go ahead and do it anyway mm -hmm. and of course you know and then um, my publisher rejected then and then i was like oh shoot i don't know any other publisher in the market i and then i was looking at all these other websites where you have to submit these transcripts and and the easiest thing for me to do was actually turn around the same book um and package it very differently and i wrote back to the publisher again like asking for a reconsideration and they signed me in a week uh after that and and hence the book finally came out right and so a lot of people don't talk about the rejections and maybe i could have just given up saying hey you know they rejected i don't know anyone else and you know maybe i should not write maybe i am a nobody maybe who will care about my journey and so on right i mean so sometimes i think willing uh, willingness to take a chance um on yourself and being okay if that project doesn't work out right and i think a lot of times we always think about what if something doesn't work out we don't talk about what if something works out mm. right and ultimately that is um a big step up for your own life and we don't talk about that so i think um you know that that has sort of helped me to sort of take those different uh, chances and not really worry about the outcome and of course there is disappointment that comes mm. sometimes if it doesn't work out but you know that doesn't stop uh me from trying new things Uh, I'll get back to career hopping in a bit, but before that, uh, has even as badminton or you being a badminton player or you being an athlete, has it helped you to visualize better, to maybe learn how to? Obviously, you, you spoke about how to how to take a loss and you know also how to enjoy your victories. Yeah, because you can't get uh, you know <clears throat> you can't just enjoy it way too much and because. you have to play you have to start from 1-0 and you have to start yeah. from the first set again yeah and have you also learned the art of visualizing success because sometimes in sport uh, when you when even when anyone is in any sport as a matter of fact you kind of visualize the you know the where is the shot coming from yeah. or then where where am i going to hit it next sure. whether it's badminton or whether it's cricket or whether it's any sport has that helped you even in your business uh, and in your career life as well have you visualized everything um. that you wanted to do and as it kind of you know being i think uh, yes and no like um, i mean of course you know when you are when you are uh, when you are a kid and then you know you're seeing all these players winning and you know mm. you know you're starry eyed and star struck and yes yeah you want to be one of them and so on right um and similarly when you are you know move into your career and you see all these famous people then of course you're again starry eyed and you want to be one of them mm -hmm. um and so on right and i think uh, i over a period of time at least at this point in time i think uh, i've 
I probably not so much now, maybe, maybe, maybe 10 years ago, you know, you're like, oh, that's how success will look like. I mm-hmm. want to be. But then when you realize that, you know, um, your journey to success is very different from uh, someone else. Right. And I think uh, you stop putting so much emphasis on the success itself. And then at least you try to sell, uh, uh, tell yourself to enjoy the, <coughs> uh, the process and the journey itself, as opposed to. Uh, you know, standing on the podium with that big trophy, right? I think, uh, yes, at some point, yes, I think very early on your career, wherever, if it's sport or career, you're thinking about it. But then at some point, uh, you don't uh, you don't uh, lay so much emphasis about it. And since you brought this up, uh, there is something very interesting uh, that um, that I came across. And then, of course, I've also written in the book is this concept of focused illusion um, that we we lay our eyes on the ultimate prize in the end so much, right? That we work hard, work hard, we work hard thinking that, hey, when I get that trophy is when I'm ultimately going to feel successful mm. or uh, that's when I'm ultimately going to be happy because all of us, what what does the trophy really mean, right? It means it's for us in our head, it is um, uh, as, as an emblem for um, success or happiness. That's what we think we're going to feel. And uh, there is this concept of focus illusion where we think we're ultimately going to feel happy when we're going to be successful, but that is not true at all uh, because we fall into this happiness trap of uh, this milestone in the sense that, oh, when I get this promotion, I'm going to be happy. Oh, when I buy, buy this house, I'm going to be happy. Oh, when I buy this car, oh, when I, I don't know, like get into MBA, I'll be happy. And we keep setting these milestones for ourselves because as human beings, I think we always want more. And, um, you know, today maybe success is this, but 10 years from now, this is not success for me anymore. You know, it is, you know, moved 10 steps ahead or it's changed Mm -hmm. completely, right? So basically what I'm trying to say is that, uh, you know, visualizing that person and, you know, thinking what success or happiness is going to be like, is just a trap uh, in the sense that uh, it's, you know, because uh, for me, it's happened where you're ultimately when you're holding that uh, cup or, you know, you're getting that award or whatever it is, right? Um, It is, you're like, oh, this is it. I thought I'm actually going to feel like, Mm -hmm. you know, way more awesome than what I'm actually feeling. And it's not true, right? I think, so ultimately, I think um, it's about what you feel uh, in your uh, head and um, how you're feeling about it, um, you know, a success or a failure or happiness, whatever. It is all about what you're telling yourself inside. And uh, a lot of times we are seeking happiness on the outside, but we need to be looking more inwards actually for that happiness as opposed to uh, outside. So even even uh, success becomes very relative. What is success and what is not success? That doesn't mean that uh, maybe Saina Nainwal is more successful as a player than I am, but am I any less successful than her as a sportsman? Mm. Is, is again a very uh, important uh, question uh, that you can ask uh, yourself and uh, so I think your yeah, metric is uh, very very different but I think that's how about sometimes how do you deal with your own success is another conversation altogether because it's always relative yeah because I mean when I say visualization I mean the process yeah not visualizing the end outcome yeah but visualizing okay even before you go to a I mean when you have a match again mm-hmm. say one of your biggest rivals yeah and you go on the court and before you go on the court you can actually you have you have some things that uh, keep telling you saying that this guy's or this girl's strength is this or she's going to do this or she might uh, serve here or she might serve there and you're actually visualizing that as a process oh yeah of course I think and uh, that I mean just to uh, complete what I'm saying using that in in corporate life or using that in you know in business life like mm-hmm. visualizing your daily processes, visualizing those projections go up or visualizing those conversations with your uh, to-be clients in, in, in whatever sense, right? Because at the end of the day, what you tell yourself is very, very important. What you, what kind of conversations you're having to yourself is very, very important. I mean, you need to be very optimistic and pumped up all the time. Otherwise, if slight negativity can make your entire day go wrong and then one day goes wrong, your week might go wrong and so on and so forth. So how has that shaped uh, your corporate life as well this process of you know just visualizing the entire process i think um yeah i think uh, in sports or even say chess or whatever right i think if you've played any um uh you know taken any sport uh very seriously there is a uh, set of rules and you're operating among uh, within that set of yeah. rules in terms of what you can play and what you can't and of course you're always trying to think two steps ahead um <laughs> 
when you're playing a game and things don't different in our uh, real life as well right and and one thing is <clears throat> uh you know playing on the court is one and there is also a lot of games that you play off the court as well right um especially if it's a team sport you know there's a team dynamic and how do you sort of maneuver how do you sort of become a captain of a um if it's a team sport right i think there is a lot that uh, that goes and you know definitely sports definitely plays a big role and and and, uh, and imagine you're probably uh thinking about it in that direction or training for it from the age of 10 right and so that sort of also becomes very comes very uh, naturally uh, to you to sort of you know how do you uh, play the game in court or outside uh, of the court uh, for sure and to answer uh, you know this other part where you actually spoke about the stories that you tell yourself matter yes i think uh, that that really shows in your actions um, on court um, as well as off court sometimes you feel like oh i'm not a good player or if you even show the fact that you're not confident today on court or you're feeling lethargic on court or whatever right i think it's also what you tell yourself because it ultimately your body language speaks right it's very similar even in our professional uh, career say if you're if you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to raise money for the first time or you're speaking on stage for the first time and um, you know if you're if you're really going to be telling yourself hey I think I'm going to be a shit show today. I'm going to make a fool of myself or I'm going to forget this and or, you know whatever it is, right? Anything. I, I think your body language will speak, your words will speak even if you um I mean even if you don't say the words, I think um your body and you know like your language will speak for itself. So yes, I think of course I think uh, what the stories that you tell uh yourself uh matter a lot and a lot of times i think we are own uh, we are very detrimental to our own success sometimes our minds and the words that we choose are very detrimental to our own success we don't have to wait for the world to pull us down <laughs> or we are sometimes unfortunately capable of pulling ourselves down break it till you make it <laughs> uh yeah sometimes in a good sense yes yeah. i think um, sometimes if you're able to you know walk up that uh, you know stage with your uh, head high up and talk like you know you're a diva you know it then uh, even if it's your first time on stage and uh, sometimes that's all that matters yeah anyway i mean i i want to say this uh, to all the listeners and all the viewers to please check out to this 30 it's available and and put in a few links as well because uh, this is an amazing book especially for uh for people who are a big fan of self help books this will be a it will this will be a very refreshing hey, it's not a self help book it will be a refreshing <laughs> change it will be a, it'll, because it's not a motivation book it's not a self help book it's it's so relatable uh, i think even guys in your early 20s or even early 30s everyone will relate to it there are a few chapters that resonated with me a lot and uh, i i can safely say that uh, you know it kind of gives you a different perspective and uh, You can also understand Shani as a person because, like I said, she has too many slashes, and we are going to start covering that now. <laughs> uh, career hopping, right? We we discussed that in detail. I mean, we didn't we didn't discuss that in detail. Sorry, but how, what's the first step to take? I mean, if you want to hop, uh, say from business development, I'll give you two scenarios, uh, Shani. Okay, let's do this. I mean, there's a, a, a person A and person B. Uh, one person started uh, his career in business development, and he wants to get into product and this person b she started her career in hr and uh, she's doing recruitment and now she wants to get into uh public relations or pr you know and she, that's her interest mm -hmm. uh what would be the first steps for each of these people from your own experience so first of all what's very interesting about both the examples that you gave is um it's the easiest transition i know uh, so, because when you talk about hr to pr in the sense that both are very uh, people facing jobs right and i think you probably um you know have uh, people skills already if you are in hr so i think you know you sort of build on that to move into uh, <clears throat> your uh, pr role or whatever it is uh, that you want to do right and uh, one of the things is even even within pr or hr i think um I, there are different roles, right? That's so why I don't know what specific role within HR this person is doing. Recruitment. But Let's say recruitment. Recruitment. Okay. Yeah. So I think um, uh, I would say like first thing is when you want to change a job or a career line, in respect to what it is that you're doing, uh, in in both scenarios that you mentioned, there are uh, the first of uh, the first thing is always to see if you can, you know, moonlight some job or volunteer somewhere, or you can do like a part time something. 
uh, to see if you like it because you're assuming that you're going to like mm. it, right? Um, see, for example, when you spoke about sales and product development, you know, it's so important for, uh, you know, product guys to understand sales, yeah. right? Uh, that as a process itself, right? So uh, I think there's a lot of benefit to moving to one to the other. But I think each, uh, the grass is always greener on the other side, right? So it's always, I would say the first step would be to see if there's a way for you to um, experiment or play around that role a bit. Uh, and I think most organizations today are also very open to the idea of, you know, you transitioning within the company and so on. But you don't have to do something full time just because it's very exciting in the beginning. If there are some baby steps that you can take to see if this is something that you really like, I would say that's that should be the first step. Even like a lot of people... Um, you know, when I'm talking somewhere, they say, hey, I want to be an entrepreneur. I have this idea, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to start. Or oh, I don't know if I can quit my job to do this. Uh, I say, you don't have to quit. Who said you have to quit? There are a lot of founders who today in the market that you'll see that they didn't quit on day one. I don't know why everybody thinks if you want to start up, you have to quit. That's not the first step. The first test is for you to go understand your customer, mm -hmm. right? Is there a need for this product? Maybe you need to pilot it first and are people willing to pay for it? And you can run these as small weekend experiments to begin with. The first step is not quitting your job. The first step is actually going and testing, testing and validating your idea with the customers. I also see a lot of people who come and talk to <clears throat> investors before they, you know, take the plunge. <laughs> and investors are the worst people to talk to. You know, you should go talk to your customers first because you're ultimately building for them. So, so yeah, I think uh, my suggestion in when if you're making this transition is to you know take those baby steps and um, uh, get a feeler of it before you ultimately uh, make that change. Okay. Since you went, you you spoke about venture capital, like venture capital and investment. You're a venture capitalist, right? I mean, how did that career change happen with you? I'm just curious to know. How did you become a venture capitalist from you know say working in different uh, companies? How did that yeah. happen? So when I moved on from a corporate career, uh, I wanted to do something very different. So that's when TED.com had come to India. There was TED Talks uh, mm -hmm. back then and their partner company in India, which is called Inc. Um, I was working with them. This is, we're talking 2010, right? Like very well, like I was in my early 20s, I think, uh, mid 20s. Okay. So uh, I said, okay, I don't want to be another uh, frog in the pond. I want to go get out of the pond and explore the world mm -hmm. so so when i so that was my first step to saying okay i'm gonna go do something completely different and uh, so i went and joined them and of course i was following ted back then ted talks and i was very fascinated with the idea of you know thinkers and doers coming together mm -hmm. on one single platform and how they're all changing the world mm -hmm. so i wanted to work there so um and i thought this is a good way to know what's really out there and maybe i thought i will find that aha moment for myself because I also wanted to really discover myself. So this was my first uh, step towards uh, doing that. So I thought surrounding myself uh, with ideas is the best way to start. And I did that for three, four years. I was there for three, four years and unfortunately nothing really happened, but I met some fascinating people. And then I was so um, <clears throat> amazed with all the work that people were doing. I thought, okay, you know, this is great. You're getting to meet them and hang out with them. Now I want to be a part of the process of the ideas actually taking up the ground. If, you know, maybe I want to be working with some of these guys five years before they actually become famous, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's when I started getting very curious about the startup ecosystem. This is back in 2013, 2014, when there was a lot of conversation about, you know, the Indian startup ecosystem, companies like Flipkart and Ola and all of them came into existence in Mobi and so on. So so in 2014, I remember I said, okay, I'm going to go explore this new world where ideas actually take off the ground and maybe I'll find my an idea of my own and find myself, right? Or find my aha moment. And uh, that's when I got into the startup ecosystem, trying to figure out what is it that I want to do. So I consulted with a few startup accelerators. I worked uh, um, um, uh, at, an, at a startup back then and uh, a couple of gigs for like a year, year and a half and got got some idea of what the whole ecosystem uh -huh. works like. And uh, and then ultimately in 2015, there was this uh, Valley-based fund called 500 Startups. They were looking to set up their India team and, you know, to invest more actively in India. And yeah, I ultimately joined them, which was on, but that was venture capital, which was completely uh -huh. uh, different from uh, what I had done uh, before. But, you know, the good thing is, you know, had I not that done that, 
exploratory phase for a year and a half. I don't know if this would have happened, right? So I think uh, that sort of helped. And I thought, okay, you know, VC is great. And maybe I'll have my aha moment because now I'm surrounded with ideas where people are coming to me with their own ideas, right? And I thought I'll have an idea of my own. And this was this was great. And I, more than anything, it seemed like the right thing to do because I've always been very uh, fascinated with the whole idea of building something from scratch and being through that process of uh, 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 seeing something take into shape. So yeah, I think uh, it sort of helped me get there. So yeah, I think it took, it, yeah, it's not, it's uh, a lot of these things were not by design. It just so happened that, you know, um, it, it all. You just happened. grabbed the opportunity at the right time. And um, yeah, sometimes you just follow your curiosity and you just do something for the fun or the adventure or for the sake of learning itself, right? And without asking what am I going to get out of this, right? And, and uh, for example, when I, uh, I decided to leave my corporate job to work in, say, uh, you know, Ted or Inc, you know, talking about concept of thought leadership, which these things didn't exist 12 years ago, right? And uh, I was I was willing to take the chance to say, I don't want to be working as an engineer anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was the first big change. And then from there on, I said, okay, I'm going to go explore the startup ecosystem. Uh, and I still remember a lot of people saying, hey, if you don't get back into corporate, it might become too late because you already took a four-year mm-hmm. break working mm-hmm. for something really random. Uh, and now you're exploring something totally different and and there was no job. And then I did that for a year and a half. And so, you know, you should be willing to, you know, take those uh, chances. And of course, I think you're also fortunate financially to take those chances, which I was fortunate. So, you know, you are able to uh, take these chances and ultimately it works out. Sometimes it might, it may not have worked out also. I don't know. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, but it did eventually uh, work out. And yeah, now last seven, eight years have been very actively involved in the ecosystem now. Yeah. I mean, uh, seven, eight years in the venture capital space, uh, in a decade that a lot of things happened, 2010 to 2020. And of course, yeah. we uh, started the new decade with COVID. We had a very good year in 2021 from a VC point of view. And now the entire world, I mean, I, I don't know what to say this, but a lot of things are happening uh, for good and the bad as well. So as a VC who has so much of experience, seven, eight years in this era is extremely good amount of experience how do you see the space and what what are what would what's your take on what's happening right now and is there an end to this is there an end to the funding winter that is there and are we going to see a lot more uh you know funding opportunities for you know uh, startups in the near future how do you see this whole thing shaping up in the near future uh-huh. and disclaimer we are in november 2022 just, uh, just wanted to make this quite clear because it's, if you are watching this uh, after 10 years, this might not be relevant, hopefully. <laughs> but yeah, I just wanted to make that disclaimer here. Shall so I think um, absolutely, I think uh, every, uh, you know, we've seen enough crashes over, you know, the last one or two decades, right? I think, and I think there is always um, a comeback. And yes, sometimes it will take a year, sometimes it might take two or three, but then I think there's always a comeback. But I think the, uh, Indian startup ecosystem is uh, definitely uh, very, very promising. And I think we will see a lot more activity, I think, in the next uh, seven, 10 years. I think it's very, very promising. It's a good time to be either starting uh, starting up or to be investing in India right now, because I think the next 10 years is really, really uh, bright. And I think more than anything, even if you see um, the quality of uh, the founders who are building this, are they phenomenal, who are working on uh, phenomenal products and uh, and uh, time and again i think indian entrepreneurs have also proved that they can build uh products at um at scale for global uh markets as well right and i think uh, there is a lot to offer uh, from the indian startup ecosystem so i think yes in terms of funding winter i think we always go through these cycles i think 2015 2016 was when we had another such thing, but then there's always a correction. One or two years, there's slowdown, which is also good for the ecosystem. Some corrections are good, and um, yeah, I think in a, in a year or so, hopefully, you know, things will get back to trying, and everyone's going to be happy again. Uh, looking at the next decade uh, till 2030, what are the emerging areas that you are interested as a VC? I think um, one thing that uh, I've been very um, uh, curious about is uh, there's been so much conversation around um, uh, climate uh, climate change and you know carbon footprint and so on and slowly in the last year or two we've, we have started seeing a lot of uh, founders looking at these space more seriously um, and looking to build around this and I think there is going to be 
this i mean well there is already a lot of work already happening right i mean we're talking about evs and uh so on but i think this space will explode over the next um 7 years to 10 years so i think this is something that i think i want to spend a lot of time on you know understand the uh, the mechanics and you know build an investment <coughs> thesis around it and hopefully start getting more active in those areas you know i mean climate change is a very real thing i mean especially a guy who grew up in bangalore i can safely say that uh, the summer temperatures in bangalore is increasing as much as the petrol prices are increasing every year so yeah. <laughs> it is a, it is a bad thing and especially if you go to delhi and see what's happening there so i i wonder what kind of solutions you know entrepreneurs can build for climate yeah. change and stuff but uh, emerging areas uh, apart from you know climate is there anything that uh, some i mean is is it does ai metaverse you know blockchain all these things fascinate you as well i think they're definitely um, very very uh, uh, promising uh, areas uh, but uh, i think um, it it's not really my area of expertise so i don't want to talk too much about you know crypto and um, mm-hmm. um, metaverse and so on uh, it's too early to tell uh, in my opinion i think uh, hopefully if somebody is watching this video 10 years from now maybe it is a real thing by then <laughs> and um, <Hopefully. laughs> yeah so uh, you never uh, you never know but i think uh, there are a lot of uh, problems or opportunities that um, exist within the indian market just because of our demographic being so diverse so there is so much more uh, opportunity in the sense that there are problems which are so unique to india that only indian entrepreneurs can build and uh, solve for and i think um, i think that's that's another space that um, you know you can keep looking at you know the emerging billion or next day emerging 500 or the emerging 200 million people right i think there is so much that you can build for each of these categories because we're so diverse economically uh geographically demographically and so there is so much more that you can do yeah, there are four indias and one india tier one tier two tier three tier yeah. four i mean economically number of people in one particular tier is like one billion people but the entire gdp is also one billion yeah. it's it's surreal i mean that's how amazingly diverse our country is yeah and you know ashali very interesting when i read your bio you have you've had experience in multiple startup ecosystems across the globe not just uh you know india uh you being from bangalore obviously bangalore happens to be one of the main epicenters if i can use that word for startups in india but you've also uh, you know had a in, had fairly good number of interactions with israeli founders in the israeli startup ecosystem as well as bay area right yeah. what what can indian founders learn if at all there is anything new from your different uh, startup ecosystems i think um, i think to some degree i think there is a little bit of uh, level uh, playing uh, field i would say now i mean in today's times right i mean very different say if you were talking 10 years ago right i mean i remember when i was at 500 uh, we were always talking about oh how do you build this um, valley based mindset uh, or uh, for uh, for founders here and so on now with the travel and exposure that all of us have i think uh, it's already uh, uh, getting there in terms of you know um you know how do you think about building at the global scale from day mm-hmm. one you're not thinking short term you're thinking long term um and so on so these are uh, key things that uh, i think now it doesn't matter which part of the world but as entrepreneurs i think these are things that you need to um imbibe and possess probably from day one when you're trying to build a company uh, so i don't think that's very very uh, different i think that mindset is there in terms of the ecosystem by and large yeah this is just the last question before we wrap up uh, i believe this is my uh, honest opinion that when how you look at the world it's really dependent on what kind of work you do and everything because everything is hardwired in your brain and the perception of what you are seeing it's it all depends on what kind of work you do like for example if you are in deep tech you look at the world in a different way if you are a doctor you start looking at the world in a different way and if you are a sports person you look at the world in a different way and definitely if you are a politician you look at the world in a different way but you happen to have a lot of lot of these experiences of venture capitalists i mean you have done a lot of things in your life including travel to different cultures and you have you have witnessed a lot of things so how does how does shanli prakash perceive the world how does she look at the world and what is she uh if i may use the word what do you envision the world being maybe in the next one year or two years because we got those days when you can give forecast for 10 years right so <laughs> for two years what do you see the world as i think 
uh, uh, I'm I, I, based on the conversations around everywhere. I think um, I think there's generally a lot more consciousness amongst uh, people uh, where we are talking about um, um, you know say um, wherever we think we have sort of uh, misused our uh, you know it say natural resources or uh, culture or value systems and all of that right and I think. Um, I feel like everything's life's like a circle, you know, everything is sort of going to, uh, come back and we are all sort of trying to go back to our roots, right. Um, where we are saying, you know, we're all hooked on to our phones and, uh, uh, you know, like social media and, you know, people are going back to, you know, detoxing and, you know, cutting off from, you know, deleting Instagram or, um, people are also looking at how can they grow their own food now and, so there are a lot of things I think people are sort of trying to go back uh, in time, right? And I think that's that that's how I think the world will become at some point where we will make an attempt to go back to our roots uh, and try and understand all the things that are of high value, but we have lost it, right? And uh, for uh, for whatever for whatever uh, technological advancements that we are seeing. So I think I I think uh, the in in the, in the next few years i really hope that we will see like a more holistic uh, life and you know trying to understand how we can have a healthy mind and soul that trying to i wouldn't say we'll try to reverse say like environment and stuff right but i think we will do like our own way of trying to bring back whatever we have lost over time or say human connection we will try to bring back and the food and the quality of our living right we'll try to bring it back in our own way so i think we will ultimately go back to our roots at least make an attempt to do so Sustainable living yeah, and yeah. being more mindful, more emphasis conscious, yeah. on mental health, which is yeah. now becoming a real conversation. Thankfully, yeah, more emphasis is put on mental health. Growing up, nobody, I mean, people would say nothing is wrong with you. If you say anxiety, they would be like, hey, no, no, no. But now at least people are talking about it. People are actually, they know, they're very cognizant of all these things. So. Yeah. Fascinating, Shani. I wish I could uh, talk to you for at least two more hours, but I know I'm very mindful of your time mm-hmm. and uh, it's been an so absolute much. pleasure to have you on this episode and uh, I could only wish to, uh, to have you again on one more episode where we can talk about other range of topics because I feel that, you know, these are questions which were very, I mean, I, 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 we just scratched the surface, I would say, when it comes to the kind of questions I wanted to ask you, but Thank you so much for making uh, some time and I hope to see you very, very soon here again. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure to be here today. Thank you.